most countries around the Western world, there exists a political party that centers around the labor-based interests. These countries come in forms like Germany's SPD, socialist parties like the very creatively named Socialist Party of France, and others like in the UK and Australia which are simply called Labour Parties. You depending. Of all this big talk between ideologies of capitalism and communism, this 20th century movement is not talked about enough. Many of these parties are responsible for most of the workers' rights we enjoy, especially those in Australia. In Australia, when the first Labour majority won in 1910. Dominating both the lower house and the senate, they saw the establishment of a maternity allowance, increased welfare, land tax reform and pension extensions. The kind of policies that were directly in the interest of most of Australians at the time. And there's also Labor Day, which until year 7 I thought was about women giving birth. Yeah. The United States is an exception. Out of the many advanced capitalist countries, there is one nation that is exceptional beyond all others for their complete lack of labor-based party. The land of freedom and democracy never had a successful political party that directly represented their biggest demographics, workers and potentially small farmers, and their interest. Freedom. This odd fact is explored in a paper quite quaintly called Why There Is No Labour Party in the United States by Robin Archer. There were some interesting conclusions as to why America is, it seems in this way exclusively, so exceptional. Robin Archer's paper compares the union movements between Australia and the United States around the 19th century in which labour-based interests began forming. In Australia, in the wake of newfound political support for workers, the Labour Party was born and, in the same way, America America represented these interests through a conference of the American Federation of Labor, or AFL, a union council that in spite of its name failed to kick the goal of party formation. The reason why this paper chose the comparison between the United States and Australia was because it shared many similar characteristics to the United States at the time, and because Robin probably didn't know about the hit society simulator World Box. In the 19th century, both Australia and the United States were former colonial slash British settlements with the independent politics that developed a union movement considering the formation of a Labour Party in the 1890s. This paper sought to compare economic and social factors like prosperity, union organisation, farmers, race and immigration, political factors like suffrage, electoral and government systems, courts and repression, and ideas and values such as social egalitarianism, freedom of religion, and so socialism and try to figure out how they affect each respective country. Before I read the conclusion of this study, here is a rundown this paper had for the respective nations in the 1890s. Australia. The first unions formed in the 1830s and stabilised in the golden 1850s where craft unions managed to win victories like an 8 hour work week, not to be confused with the victories of craft beers which was to create alcoholic hipsters. They started organising into councils in 1856 and began including non-skilled and semi-skilled unions in mining, shearing, port industries in the 1880s. Surprise to all that'll help them later. Most important of these was the amalgamated shearers union ASU in 1886 because apparently the sheep were the Australian economy at the Times. As the 1890s began, unions started organising major strikes, first one being the Maritime Strike, which is misleading name as it only partially involves maritime officers not wanting to leave the Melbourne trades hall, and largely involves shearers unions who wanted to make sure only union shearers existed, known as a closed shop. This spread to all major unions in the country where the government sided with employers and it fell apart after two months. Only after the strike did an epic fail in 1891 did unions agree with big ounces of enthusiasm to start a Labour Party. First electoral test got a quarter of the vote, giving the party the balance of power. Queensland was the first colony to have a Labour government victory where Anderson Dawson formed a minority government for six days, but hey, it was the first one, you know? Good on you, Queensland. The only good thing you've done besides birth Bob Catter and colonise New Guinea. They formed a minority government on the federal level with Chris Watson in 1904, linked to a video someone did on him in the description. And finally, in 1908-09, Labor formed its first majority government under Andrew Fisher. United States of America! 
The first signs of a union movement was in the 1820s, which was unstable until the 1850s. First durable union was a printer's union, followed by other craft unions. Continuous trade conflict formed after the 1870s recession, back then called a depression, so I think people were kind of sad back then. 1891 saw craft unions in Canada and North America form the predecessor of the American Federation of Labor, or AFL. Unskilled workers began unionizing at the time, mainly in mining and railroad industries. Major strikes occurred in the early 1890s, which saw governments deploy military and allow private militias on behalf of employers to completely defeat the unions, often violent. Meanwhile, farmers formed a party which was pro-labor, gaining a bit of traction in some specific areas. As this occurred, America sank into the 19th century's worst depression. In this context, the American Federation of Labor became the closest it ever had to forming a labor-based party. In an 1893 convention, they voted on whether to form a political program modeled after to the British Labour Party, possibly having an alliance with small farmers. This was a contentious prospect and a lot of dirty infighting occurred between anti-party AFL President Gompers and his ally versus pro-party unionists, primarily from Chicago, who I presume saw others getting in their way and said, Hey, I'm walking here. And yes, Chicagoans, that is how we see you. Gompers won and a Labour Party never formed. So now that we got the context out of the way, let's finally bring about the conclusion. This document splits its conclusions into negative findings, possibilities that can be eliminated, and positive findings, findings that couldn't. Reasons that aren't the reasons America has no Labour Party are as follows. Prosperity. One argument for why the US has no Labour Party is because they had not enough economic grievances. However, the findings when compared to Australia show the US had inferior prosperity, to which I say sucked in Yanks. We ate more beef per person in the 1800s, and that was preemptive revenge for you guys stealing all our women in World War II as Japanese war propaganda proclaimed you did. And then again, if did result in that wife song, The Bridal Train, which I really do enjoy. When it comes to the gap between expected and actual living standards, which is primarily driven by commoners looking at the living standards of the wealthy, the standard that is promoted in the country, and the standard that they came from, this was also considered functionally the same in both. Farmers Alliance. Labour populist alliances between workers and farmers was present in Australia and would have been likely to form a Labour Party in the USA given both have access to farmers through certain unions. Racism? Racism played a role in the American and Australian labour movements of the time. Hostility against black and Chinese people was present in both. This was in part because such labour was exploited by owners and made it more difficult for workers to demand better wages. In Australia this ended up boosting Labour Party popularity as racism was rife and targets of racism, the Chinese, were yet to be present enough to make a difference electorally. This was also the case in northern industrial areas of the United States. Racism essentially gave both movements a platform beyond workers' rights to a similar effect. Southern and Eastern European immigration and growth of racism against them had not yet reached a point in either nation to have a notable effect on the movement either. Suffrage? White male privilege, in the most literal sense possible, suffrage was well established in many countries when they formed socialist governments, like Australia, where it was used by the labour movements to legitimise and provide a means for their government to grow on a popular stage. And the threat of class-based systems, or the potential of those systems being reimposed, gave the labour movement the ability to fight on pro-democratic grounds, further expanding the avenue of campaign for them. Egalitarianism, the prevalent of the idea of everyone being equal in America is often one explanation proposed as to why it hasn't formed a Labour Party. The reasoning is that the idea prevented a class-based mindset, instead having a based sigma grindset, and prevented the expression of grievances that labour movements are based on by viewing everyone as having an equal status. The presence of egalitarian views was also extremely present in Australia, however. Additionally, this mindset only served to strengthen the movement as people were able to point out the disparity or threat of disparity between the ideal of egalitarianism and its reality. Freedom and liberty. America! 
Fuck yeah! It's proposed that Americans' value of individuality and liberty reduce collective actions such as that done by the labour movement. However, ideas of liberty were present in both Australia and America, and such ideas were touted by their respective labour movements as the reason on why you should join your unions and take collective action. As not doing so would put individual freedoms under threat by preventing a person from the freedom to develop their capacity essentially get good scrub by not giving him a good enough living. To translate that in mainstream political commentator, literally 1984, freedom of slavery doublespeak. There were some factors that this paper considered not significant, but were actually quite distinct between these two great awesome nations. System of government. The United States had a POTUS. It was presidential, whereas Australia is parliamentary. These government types both fostered a two-party system and were both structured in a way that new parties, including labour-based parties, could win the balance of power and expand from there. So the difference isn't really major in that way. Federalism. The US had a federal system of government where Australia had to establish a government in 1890, though angry Santa Claus Parks was doing his goddamn best to try. This, however, would not have stopped the Labour Party from forming as a federal system, although typically harder for making change when in power, is easier for a Labour Party to gain a foothold in the system as it had more points of access for a new party to enter and supported the ability to start footholds in strongly Labour supportive areas to start off the movement. Courts. The the US has weirdly powerful courts, like Lee's Nerve, where in Australia courts could be overruled by legislation, courts were used in America to suppress unions, and they were very effective silences. Some argue that due to this it would have pushed Labour to not establish a party, as it would lead to even worse suppression. However, this argument is not supported by the fact that one of the only ways to influence the courts legally in the US is through electoral pressure. Politicians elect the judges, so the unions had an incentive to become electorally significant in order to put pressure on courts to be less hostile to them. So, to quote the paper, explanation based on the level of prosperity, the prospects of a labour populist alliance, the intense racial hostility towards blacks and Chinese people, the emergence of similar attitudes towards new European immigrants, the early introduction of manhood suffrage for whites, the electoral system, the strength of social egalitarianism, and the prevalence of ideas about individual freedom can all be ruled out. Five tributes, and by tributes I mean possible explanations, are explored in this paper that remain. Weakness of new unionism, extent of union repression, importance of religion, and the loony lefty socialist agenda, or more accurately, socialist sectarianism slash leftist infighting.png. New unionism. This refers to the growth of semi-skilled and non-skilled unions, which were dubbed new unions. Things like mine, rail and port workers, who were quite different to specialist unions, which provided workers with skills like cigarette makers. Both Australia and America started off with the mostly craft unions, and both countries grew in unskilled unions in the late 19th century. In the United States, however, these unions were far more stunted in growth than their Australian counterparts. They were but a portion of America's unionised workforce by 1893 when the decision was made to not establish a Labour Party. In Australia, on the other hand, new unions were the main founders of the Labour Party. They pushed pro-worker policies and ideas, were the main unions behind the major strikes, and they were the base for the actual party's organisation, which allowed it to survive early setbacks. New unions in the USA also supported a Labour Party, but they lacked a lot of the above to actually push for it. Repression. The scale of difference between the US and Oz was as insane as one of those Minecraft YouTube thumbnails of a noob pro and hacker template where Australia was the noob at repression and America was the most certainly several command blocks above them. The US didn't have just judicial repression as discussed earlier when governments in both countries send police and troops to break up major strikes in the 1890s. There was often four times more armed men sent to break up American unions than Australia and in every Every instance more armed men per striker, and it always ended far more violently 
in the US. In Australia, repression helped because it defeated the union movement and gave them a reason to invest their resources into politics. In America, repression hindered because unions were destroyed. They were weakened to a point where, although motivated, were completely unable to push the union body of the AFL to form a Labour Party because they lacked numbers, money and influence as it was violently taken from them, allowing craft unionists like AFL President Gompers, a man who makes me think of those green goopy creatures from the mobile game Cut the Rope, who was against forming a Labour Party to hold most of the power. This repression also succeeded in reducing the legitimacy of the Labour movement and hence reducing electoral outcomes if the party were to form. And access to political allies in the government conducted propaganda campaigns to justify their violence. Violence. This document by Robin Archer features comparisons of multiple strikes between Australia and the United States, and they all show the striking contrast in how workers were treated between the two countries. I'll show you one example here. Comparing the 1892 Broken Hill Miners' Strike and the Coeur d'Alene Miners' Strike of the same year. In Broken Hill, 6,000 strikers were met with 285 police officers. In Coeur d'Alene, 4,000 strikers were met with 50 1500 state and federal troopers, making 188 far more heavily armed forces per 100 strikers. The result? 25 arrests and zero deaths in Australia's Broken Hill, and in Coa Delane, strikes suffered 600 arrests and 6 deaths. Quoting from the paper will serve this picture better. The New South Wales government resisted company pressure to deploy soldiers in Broken Hill and instead relied solely on the build-up of police. In both cases, the strike leaders were arrested and charged with conspiracy. But while union members in Broken Hill were continually harassed and sometimes arrested by partisan police magistrates, their counterparts in Coeur Lane were arrested en masse. With the exception of those who managed to escape across the border to Montana, nearly every union member and every union sympathiser was rounded up and held in a makeshift bullpen. Martial law was declared and remained in force for four months and it was the publicly stated goal of the military to destroy the union and uh, drive its members from the region. Military commanders offered to free imprisoned miners who resigned from the union and two mines that were continuing to employ unionists were forced to close down and reopen with non-union labour. In addition, only in Kuadia Lane were workers killed. So much for freedom, Anna. This destruction of the unions is what fueled a lot of opposition to political involvement by craft unionists like Gompers, who along with others often cited the need to prevent complete destruction by keeping an apolitical stance. Such fears did not exist in Australia. This led to mostly unions that were already essentially destroyed to support political action and they at the time held very little sway in the US. There are other potential factors as to what stopped the American forming a Labour Party. The next being religious zealousness. America was far more religious than Australia and religious groups were far more hostile to unions than Australia. Union leaders were fearful that taking a partisan approach would emaciate their union membership as workers already had strong loyalties to existing parties that stepped from either religious ties or civil war ties. In Australia, the main two political parties at the time were less cemented and far less broadly named. How much more single issue is protectionist and free trade than Democrat and Republican? And tied to purely economic policy, where the tariffs should be lower high. Which, although still could cause problems between unions, was no threat to the union's very existence. Unions in the USA were worried that taking sides in politics would destroy their movement because it would be seen as them taking sides on matters of religion, which would utterly fracture the movement as a whole because Americans were strongly religious. Loyalties to Democratic and Republican parties can best be described by this quote from a bricklayer union secretary. We have excellent trade unionists who are warm Democrats and zealous Republicans and are ready to point with suspicion at every movement on our part towards the formation of a political organization. The only way we can be successful with our local and national trade unions is by excluding politics 
politics from them. Leftist infighting. Unlike Australia, where socialists were supportive sidelines to the actual union movement, American unions were divided into various progress-based ideologies. The worry from Americans was that the conflicts between these groups of people would make maintaining a Labour Party impossible and unstable, causing breaks within the hypothetical party. Australia's socialist ideologies came mostly from America. Oddly enough, the most destructive socialist groups in America were those who subscribed to European socialist form. Something that was not really present in Australia. The battle between pro-party and anti-party advocates in these circles caused the question to become bitter and transform into an either-or dogma between either union-based politics or party-based politics. While pure and simple unionists in America saw establishing a political party as undermining the union movement, pure and simple unionists in Australia established a political party. There are two broad reasons for why there is no Labour Party in the United States. Repression of new unions and fear of disruption and destruction due to dogmatic loyalties that came from religion and decades old socialist debates. The conclusion of this paper are as follows. In a land that often defines itself as democratic, secular and liberal. It is the importance of repression, religion and socialism that help explain the failure to establish a Labour Party.